What made you decide that I got to put my feet in this side of the, um, the legal perspective and this is where I'm going to make some real change? What what happened that, you know, because it's probably not the, what you say, the wealthiest part or where you can make the most money as an attorney is in criminal justice. You can do no, a whole bunch of other stuff. So right. why why did you choose that? Well, first of all, I, I, I tried a case um, in the in the criminal clinic when I was at SMU and I got a not guilty. Mm. So I was like, uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the first win, huh? Yeah. Okay. I think I got this down, okay. so, which I didn't. I was just learning. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, I, but uh, Senator West helped me get a job in the DA's office, and I was uh, put in the trial section. And so I did very, very well. How was, old were you then? Ooh, I was 25. 25. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I mean, the reality of it is, is they had families a lot of them, and you can't go running around in the middle of the night finding witnesses, okay, like yeah, I could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so my little group, you know, of about three or four of us who weren't married, mm -hmm. we could go do that. Mm. And so we were always ultra prepared on cases, and we won a lot of cases. We lost some, but we won some. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to get through the system as far as being promoted and being, so actually when I left the DA's office, I, I had kind of several jobs. Okay. I was a supervisor of a court and okay. other prosecutors, and I had supervision of a grand jury, and I was trying death penalty cases at the same time. Mm. So, but once again, you know, when you don't have much sense and you don't mind working all the time, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you wind up with. Okay. And so I was ripping and running all the time. Okay and uh, you know, doing that kind of stuff and working hard. Okay. And so um, then came the Randall Dale Adams case and I was asked to be a part of that. And it was obvious that Mr. Adams, uh, if you don't know about it, he was accused of shooting a police officer in the 70s in Dallas. And there was a witness called who was a juvenile who was not eligible for the death penalty, but he testified against Randall Adams. Okay. And that was a very, famous case. It went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court reversed his death sentence and rather than retry him, the Dallas County DA's office agreed to commute his sentence to life, which is unusual because he killed a police officer. Okay. Right? Okay. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, what's up with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the at the end of my career in the DA's office, um, I was part of the hearings to determine if he had had a fair trial. So I went into private practice, and then in 91, Ann Richards appointed me. Mm. So this whole thing about criminal justice reform, one of the things she asked me, which she, because she was in recovery, mm -hmm. was about alcohol and drugs and the criminal justice system. But we really didn't know a whole lot about it back then. Yeah. We yeah. didn't understand about treatment. And then she went on this thing about building more prisons. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Which we were doing, even Clinton, mm -hmm. everybody was talking about building more prisons. Mm -hmm. And what we didn't realize is that we were creating more problems than we were solving. Mm -hmm. And so um, she put me on a commission called the Punishment Standards Commission, and we changed a bunch of laws. But that's where I began to learn about new techniques, even though we didn't do them. Yeah. We tried to, but we went to other states and saw other things and looked at other outcomes and what they were doing, lowering the crime rate, rate without putting people in the penitentiary. Yeah. And then in 1996, the Houston Chronicle did a study of Harris County and African-American men, mm -hmm. especially young men who mm -hmm. picked up drug cases and had court-appointed lawyers. Every single one of them went to the pen and if you didn't fit that category, you got probation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, come on, man, is it that bad? Yeah. And then we had a study done statewide, urban counties and rural counties, and it showed that there was rampant discrimination in the criminal justice system. And that was the first time it was put on paper okay. by the state. So this whole thing about drug courts was coming mm -hmm. along, and so mm -hmm. I decided, well, let's, let's do this. Mm -hmm. And that met with resistance, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. One of the problems was I was going to do it on Tuesday nights okay. so people could work. Okay. Right? So yeah. that made a long day for me. Okay. So I'm getting to work at 839, mm -hmm. and I'm staying there until 839. And the other issue was um, just you know, that it was new yeah. and that you're taking a chance. Change. <laughs> well, you're taking a chance. So these yeah. people weren't indicted. They didn't have to fill out plea papers. And we sent them through treatment, and we dismissed the case. And we eventually got the law changed that we could expunge the case, which meant it went away. 
Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so then we had SMU come in about two or three years later and study it. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know if it was working or not. We were just working and trying to do the best we could and follow the, the research and everything and try to do it the right way, not just say we were doing right, it. Right, right, right. And so what we found was we got a 68% reduction in rearrest. Mm -hmm. And then SMU Economics Department did a cost-benefit analysis. And for every dollar spent, we had $9.34 in avoided criminal justice costs. Oh, wow. So I'm like, wow. Yeah. We're doing, we're kicking. So you got a win. You got a small win. You got a small you, win. You're seeing research. You're presenting it. So right. tell me in the political scene, match that up with the timeline. So oh. you're still a state district judge? Yes, appointed this by is Cameron in 2002 or so. Okay. By the, oh, 2001, by the time we get this study done. Okay. And so um, I didn't know what to do with it, right? And so somebody said, there's a very influential bipartisan Democrat in the legislature, and his name is Pete Gallego. And um, he's kind of well known in Central Texas. And he was a state rep. And so I remember, I, so I took all my little junk down there, you know, all my studies, you know, <laughs> and I went and found him. I made an appointment. I got to his office. Of course, you know, I'm nobody to him. I'm just some knucklehead judge, you know, from Dallas coming down here to talk to him. Mm -hmm. And so I started talking to him about it and showing him. I gave him the executive summaries and this, that, and the other. And I remember he, he, he was like, you know, just, it's just like it's just another conversation I need to get rid of and move on. Mm -hmm. And when I started talking about 68% reduction in rearrest and saving money, and he's, I remember he says, excuse me, tell me your name again? <laughs> and I, you know, where are you from? I mean, it's like the whole first part of it just yeah, yeah, was no. like that. Mm -hmm. And so he said, can, can you tell me that again? Mm -hmm. And so he, I went through it again, and I said, here's the bigger study. I mean, but here's the executive summary. Yeah. And he says, where are you from? Mm -hmm. I said, Dallas. And, and what, you, you're a, a judge? Yeah, state district. I mean, it's like the first <laughs> part just didn't even go anywhere. And so he actually took the time to read the executive summaries. He looked at them. And he says, come with me. Take a walk with me. And so we went. I don't know where we went through the hallways. And he would say, hey, uh, so-and-so, come over here. I want you to meet this judge from Dallas. He's got this program in Dallas, and, and he started talking to numbers. He said, we need to work on this. Mm -hmm. And then we'd walk some more. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, hey, hey, so-and-so, come over here. And da-da-da-da-da. And then finally, about the fourth or fifth one, uh, he said, you know, this is the first judge I've ever known who's actually done something that matters mm -hmm. and is not down here asking for um, a more pay and a better retirement package. <laughs> 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 and so I, I was... I, I didn't, you know, I didn't appreciate what it meant to him yeah. until he said that. Yeah. And so then we started um, what we call the reentry program for people. These were people who had been arrested up to 35 times. Up to 35 times. Yeah. And, Just in and, and out. Prison it's, it's, up okay. to six times. And so what I did, so, so we did this divert court on Tuesday night. Okay. So, okay, you know, working two nights a week is a lot. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I started them on Friday mornings at 8.30. Okay. So we worked late Tuesday, and we start, which meant I had a long Friday because I said all my work to do. Gotcha. So we started that program, and what we did was we sent them to prison-based treatment because most of those guys had long records, and they weren't eligible for the local stuff. Yeah. And so, um, and then we did the same thing. We brought them in. And, but I did them differently. Mm -hmm. I didn't wear a robe and I didn't sit on the bench and I just went down into the courtroom and there was uh, nothing between us but a railing and sometimes they would sit up front or, or if they were doing really well, I put them in a jury box so they could be that much closer. Yeah. And the reason I did that is I told them, you guys have been in and out of the system. You come down here to get time. I said, y'all all institutionalized, let's believe. Let's, let's, understand. let's be honest, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, and a robe doesn't mean anything to you. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. people have been telling you what to do with robes on, you go off and do what you want to. So why don't we just stop the robe business mm -hmm. and stop the judge business mm -hmm. and let's talk about how we're gonna improve our lives. 
and what kind of decisions are we going to make mm-hmm. that are going to get us back with our families? I said, y'all all burn that up. You know mm-hmm. that. They mm-hmm. don't even want to see you, most mm-hmm. of you. Mm-hmm. I said, whatever children you got, you need, you need to repair that. Yeah. And so there was a lot of um, anxiety about that with them because they thought that if I'm doing well, everybody ought to accept me back. Got you. And so we had a lot of discussions about allowing your family to heal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, they've you, been through something, too. No, you, you spent the last 20 years abusing them mm. with your behavior. And they don't want you back. And they or don't, they don't want, trust you. You have trained them to not want you back. Yeah. You did it. Yeah. It's your responsibility. That'd make you a bad person. Right. Okay, Mm -hmm. but you have to, number one, change your behavior and allow them to learn to trust you. And that's not on your timeline. Oh, that's on their timeline. Yeah. How do they receive that? uh, Good. Mm-hmm. That, not, I'm not telling you they practiced it very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. But it's definitely a different approach to, they need yeah. to hear it from this perspective of you, you continuously hurt. Right. Uh, and now that you're good, that mm-hmm. means necessarily the family's okay with you being back in their lives. They made peace with you being That's okay, right. being away. And some sometimes that can be better for the family unit that That's you right. are gone. It is better a lot of times uh, because they're at home stealing and acting crazy, getting drunk and high. They yeah. show up high. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. and you know, you, you got a brother or a sister with children at home and you show up at Thanksgiving, okay, and you, and you Judge, know. I know that all too well. Okay, well, you, you know, you I come know. In, ho- in the house acting a fool. Yeah. Right, nobody yeah. wants that, and, mm-hmm. and you do it all the time. And then the other thing is, 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 is the taking advantage of people. You know, you get in jail, and then you call your mom to come get you out. How many times, what do you think that does to your mom's emotions? You know, for you to go to jail and then you gonna call home, say, mom, I'm in jail, I need, I need some bail money. Of course, your bail money keeps going up. Mm-hmm. Cause you're in and out. Cause you're in and out. Tired of seeing so they, yeah, yeah, they're tired of dealing with you too. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, it was a process of, and so what we call that, um, we, we, I studied how to talk to people to motivate them to do better. Okay, and that's called motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. And so what you try to do is to show them kind of the disparity between or the dissonance between where they are Mm -hmm. and where they say they want to be and what they're doing to bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't want to go back to the penitentiary, but I don't want to change my friends. Mm. Okay. Okay, homie. You got to change your friends because they're all dope fiends. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And then we go along, go along, and we're good, and we're good, and then and then we we get dirty ways and have problems and stop showing up. Right. What happened? Oh, I went to check on Bobo. What, who's Bobo? Oh, that's one of my homeboys. You know, blah blah blah. So I was like, okay, where did he live? Mm-hmm. You know, well, you know, we've been tight and we've been this and that. And I said, where does he live? Back in the hood. And mm-hmm. I said, okay. I said, when you left Bobo or whatever his name is, you know, Ricky or whatever, what was he doing? Yeah. Was he getting high? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I said, and when you went back to check on him, what did you expect for him to be doing? It, have you heard that he's in recovery? Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. So let's think about what was he doing? Yeah before you got there to go check on him. Mm-hmm. Now he's probably getting high. It's okay, so what were you gonna accomplish? I'm sure you didn't go there to talk him into going into treatment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, right, so, right. I mean, if, if you were just merely going in there, and, I, and so I would tell him, I said, look, here's what, what, what Ricky or Bobo, whoever, here's what, you, you went to see him and here's what he saw. Mm-hmm. A Christmas turkey Mm-hmm. that has been taken out of the oven and it has set and cooled and it's ready for carving. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And he going to eat you. Mm-hmm. And what his goal is, is to bring you back into his life mm-hmm. because you're the missing element. Mm-hmm. I said, and you're not thinking this thing through. Yeah. You're going to wind up back in jail checking up on him. Mm. 
I said, so if we think about it, there really was no good reason to go we, check up yeah. on somebody who, you know, still a dope fiend. Right, right. I mean, come on, what are we doing? Right. And so rather than screaming and threatening and doing all this stuff, what we're trying to do in modern criminal justice is to get people to think about where they say they want to be and, and where they are, where they say they want to be, and what they're going to do to bridge the gap. Okay. And so that's called motivational interviewing by helping them understand that what you're doing won't get you to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I still have people who come up to me today and say thanks, mm -hmm. you know, because it's those kinds of conversations that made the difference.